American Indian people have long been here in Garden of the Gods at the base of Pikes Peak. They came for many different reasons. Among them was that it was an ecological crossroads where there was an abundance of wildlife and plant life that occurred in this one location, whereas in other locations they'd have to go for miles and miles to find so many things in one place. And that then made it a cultural crossroads for American Indian nations who came here for that reason as well as the bubbling springs of Manitou. The Indians out in western Kansas got on the warpath, and the government sent Colonel Sumner of the regular army to this country to chastise these Indians, which he did in good shape. Now at this time I was keeping a meat market down in the town of Lawrence, Kansas. On the north side of the Kansas River was the Delaware Indian Reservation. The tribesmen were there, and I used to buy cattle from them. There was one of these Indians that I bought cattle from by the name of Fall Leaf. Now this man was with Colonel Sumner's expedition during the summer of 1857, acting as a guide. Late in the year when Fall Leaf returned, he came over to Lawrence and showed me quite a bunch of gold nuggets tied up in a rag. I said, Fall Leaf, where did you get these? He said he got these on the Sumner expedition. He said he came to a little stream of water that was running out of the side of a mountain, got off his horse to get a drink. He saw the nuggets lying on the rocks as the water ran over them, and he just picked them up, of course. John Easter Well, Manifest Destiny was a phrase that was coined by a newspaper editor, and the idea was that the United States was destined by God to expand its borders uh, all across the continent, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Um, it was a very popular idea when it was coined in the 1840s, and uh, it is one of the reasons for the outbreak of the U.S.-Mexican War of 1846. Um, and you can imagine how the Republic of Mexico felt about this idea that was being spouted off in the United States that we're destined to expand even though there's another country already in place in these western territories. People were willing to uh, use this justification that it's God's will so we can trample uh, Mexico's rights and we can trample American Indians' rights because that whole area was populated by American Indians as well. But that didn't stop happening what did happen. And the Mexican-American War brought the United States, what is today the American Southwest, and opened the door for uh, eventually the rush to Colorado in 1859. Fall Leaf claimed he'd found the gold about two days' travel from Pike's Peak. On being asked if he could find that place again, he replied that he could. Easter proposed to pay him five dollars per day if he could go out with a party of men and show them where he found it. He agreed to go, and on the strength of that agreement, a party was formed to go out to the mountains and hunt for gold. After a party had been raised, the Indian chief said we must get him provisions for his family to last them six months. We found that we could raise a company of about 33 men with 12 wagons, 10 ox teams, and one mule team. John D. Miller Well, the Panic of 1857 uh, created a lot of hardships, especially in the American Midwest. Um, there's one figure that, due to the panic, 5,000 businesses failed. Um, many people were out of work. Uh, the value of U.S. currency plummeted. Uh, stocks plummeted. Uh, but for the, the common folk, all they knew was they were losing their jobs. Uh, people that had stores uh, did not have customers. Consequently, they had to default um, on payments. Uh, before the panic, it was real easy to get credit and uh, people were using credit to acquire furniture, you know, belongings, and all of a sudden the credit's no longer there, the currency's not worth anything. Um, it sets them up in a position where they're willing to take a chance on something or a hope of recovering their former prosperity. And for many people, that hope of recovery lies to the west, to Pikes Peak. Twenty-seven May, eighteen fifty-eight. 
The party of gold seekers set out from Lawrence, Kansas on a 43-day journey to Pikes Peak. The route was to Council Grove along the Santa Fe Trail, where other members from the region were soon to join in, then west to Benz Ford, continuing on the Cherokee Trail to the Pikes Peak region. John Easter's wagon laid back to wait for their Indian guide. After providing six months of provisions for Fall Leaf's family, the Indian guide refused to go along and unveil the source of his gold. After talking the matter over and having our teams and supplies bought for six months, we all decided to go on and do the best we could under the circumstances. J. H. Turney, one of our oldest men, had been to California, having crossed the plains in 1849, so we elected him captain of our company. John D. Miller Left the coal bank May 31. Started on foot, overtook the train at Bluff Creek. Walked 35 miles. June 1. Left camp with 10 wagons. Drove to Council Grove 15 miles. Found some very fine streams today, but little timber and fine prairie. Council Grove is built in a mud hole, but 10 or 15 houses. Saw two buffalo calves today. Augustus Voorhees. We were told on leaving Council Grove, the border town of Kansas, that beyond that point, any Indians we might meet would be hostile and we'd probably have to fight them. The boys had no fear of Indians. We were well armed and most of us had experience in the use of firearms during the Bleeding Kansas War. Jason T. Yonker June 5. Remained in camp. Captain Holmes came in today. We now have nine ox teams, two horse teams, and one mule team. Fifty head of cattle, forty-six men, two women, one child, and eight loose horses. Augustus Voorhees. James Holmes comes from New York, and he's a free stater. And he joins uh, John Brown, who is not only abolitionist, but he's an abolitionist that um, advocates violence to bring about a free territory in the abolition of slavery. So uh, you have these two people uh, who meet um, near Lawrence and eventually uh, become married, uh, but they're here in Kansas because of abolition and because of their very uh, strong beliefs that um, there shall not be slavery in these new territories. There shall not be slavery at all. Well, G. Archibald Holmes writes that um, their reasons for traveling to Colorado on this quest for, for finding gold really wasn't that much about uh, discovering the mineral or becoming wealthy. A lot of it was about adventure. And I, I think if you look at these personalities, James Holmes, Julia Archibald Holmes's wife, they're intellectuals, um, they're enlightened, and there's an unexplored territory to the west, um, you know, the Great Plains, the Front Range of the Rocky Mountains. And, and uh, Holmes had, had, by that time, uh, left behind, you know, there, there wasn't the fighting going on between the pro-slavery men and the Free Staters. He'd established a business, um, but they heard about this Lawrence party that was going to go out and seek gold along the Front Range, and here was an opportunity to expand their knowledge and uh, their world. Uh, it was exciting uh, to go into this untrammeled country and, and to see, you know, this amazing wonder like Pikes Peak. Sister Slayer, I think an account of my recent trip will be received with some interest by my sisters in reform, the readers of the Sibyl, if not by the rest of mankind, since I am, perhaps, the first woman who has worn the American costume across the Prairie Sea, which divides the great frontier of the states from the Rocky Mountains. Animated more by a desire to cross the plains and behold the great mountain chain of North America than by any expectation of realizing the floating gold stories, we hastily laid a supply of provisions in the covered wagon, and two days thereafter, the 2nd of June, we were on the road to join the Lawrence party. Julia Archibald Holmes We reached the Cottonwood Creek Crossing the 5th of June, where we found the train encamped. We were now fairly launched on the waving prairie. 
a person who has beheld neither the ocean nor the great silent uninhabited plains will find it impossible to form any adequate idea of the grandeur of the scene. With the blue sky overhead, the endless variety of flowers underfoot, it seemed that the ocean's solitude had united with all the landscape beauties. In such a scene, there is a charm for some minds, which is impossible for me to describe, but it made my heart leap for joy. Julia Archibald Holmes. At the big bend of the Arkansas, we encountered a band of Indians who were gathered there waiting for their annuities from the United States government. They made no hostile demonstrations, and we passed on. At Cow Creek, a branch of the Arkansas, we saw a herd of buffalo that were all one day passing, a solid moving mass, and we heard the trampling of them nearly all the night following. My impression was there must have been millions in numbers. Frank M. Cobb Before we reached Walnut Creek, we were told that a large body of Arapaho, Cheyenne, Kiowa, and Comanche, said to be about 8,000 of them, camped near Pawnee Fork. When we arrived in the vicinity of their camp, they gathered around us in want of flour, sugar, coffee, tobacco, and whiskey. They troubled us so much that Captain Turney told us we had better corral and pay our toll that the Indians levied tribute on all people passing through their country, and if we did not pay it, they would be likely to stampede our stock, as they considered we were trespassing on their ground and would kill their buffalo, although we had not killed any up until that time. When we corralled, he got the chiefs of the four principal tribes together, had them sit on the ground, light their pipes, and smoke the pipe of peace. Then they spread their blankets on the ground, and we brought out flour, sugar, coffee, and tobacco, and gave each chief some. The chiefs then issued their orders to their young braves, when they immediately left us and returned to camp. We bid the chiefs goodbye and pulled out for the west. John D. Miller